Top 10 Myths About Evolution, Part 3. Well, natural selection is evolution in action. Oh, and by the way, evolution has got nothing to do with the origin of life. What? That's silly. That's like saying a clock has got nothing to do with telling us the time. <laughs> You're just contradicting yourself. This mantra has been repeated so often that people often conflict the two ideas. But are evolution and natural selection the same thing? Natural selection is true, therefore, to, to you, evolution is true. The short answer is that this is one of the most oft repeated myths. Natural selection is indeed an observable process that was certainly not first discovered by Darwin, but Sir Edward Blyth, who was a creationist. Species with certain characteristics survive better in a given environment. However, natural selection is non-directional and does not lead anywhere. That is, if the environment changes, members of a species that were previously better adapted may no longer be. Evolution, on the other hand, is an unobservable process that requires direction, such as dinosaurs to birds. Natural selection can only act upon the information that already exists. When certain characteristics are selected, the overall genetic information decreases. Mutations have not been shown to reverse this process. Evolution is supposed to be an upward increase in genetic complexity. Reality is showing us quite the opposite. Things are winding down, not up. Losing information may make members of the same created kind unable to reproduce with each other, but this merely emphasizes how much loss can occur. Dog kinds always produce dog kinds. Feline kinds always produce feline kinds. Bear kinds always produce bear kinds. Reptile kinds always produce reptile kinds. People kinds always produce people kinds, etc. <laughs> Only based on genetics do you get different looking cats from other cats, for example, but they are still a cat. A. <laughs> And moreover, observational science has proven to us that, if you raise cats, you're always gonna get cats. Many evolutionists would like to give natural selection powers that it does not have. Don't let them swindle you according to your naiveness. Come on. All scientists agree on evolution. When all is said and done, your ultimate proof of evolution is an appeal to majority opinion or human authority. You often remind us that virtually all real scientists agree that evolution happened. When examining this myth, one must keep in mind that those who make this claim often rely on the belief that the only real scientists are those who accept evolution. The argument, then, essentially boils down to this. Evolutionists agree that evolution happened. This, of course, is an absurd argument, and we could just as easily say that creationists agree that creation happened. The main problem, however, is that even if every single person accepted an idea as a fact, that doesn't make it correct. History is full of examples where the majority has been wrong, including many elections in America. Evolution is another such idea. Secondly, many scientists accept evolution because the only alternative is design, which is against their naturalistic beliefs. They have a prior commitment to keeping any miraculous interaction out of their worldviews, and they accept evolution by default. But did you know, supernatural miracles are happening all over the world, apparently with people that have committed their lives to worship Jesus as Lord. Finally, there are a growing number of scientists, creationists and not, who do not find the supposed evidence for evolution to be valid or acceptable. The truth of the matter is that, while some evolutionists would like creationists, like me, not to exist, but we do, and it is past time for the myths of evolution and the myth of evolution itself to be dismissed once and for all so we can get ahead with doing real science. Well, didn't you know? The majority of people back then? Technically creationists, believed that all the planets, including the sun, revolved around the earth. Friend, first off, you cannot superimpose on me. Those folks were simply being totally and insanely inconsistent. Constantine stopped the persecutions and claimed to be a Christian too. But he also worshipped the sun god. He was the one who became the first pope. He ordered a corrupt Bible. 
Catholicism was in complete control, true Christians were hiding, and it was professed that only the Pope could interpret what the Bible said. They took a lot of teachings from the heathen Greeks, like Aristotle, and tried to put that along with the Bible. Secondly, the so-called Bible they had was even a corrupt Alexandrian text. The true Bible manuscripts written by the disciples came from the city of Antioch, where many Christians were being kept hidden from Roman powers. The Catholics would call them heretics and burn them at the stake. It was the Catholic tyrants who had the Dark Ages come in and shut down knowledge and information, not being able to make any advances in science. They were in a superstitious occult. The 1611 King James Bible attained from all the gathered traditional true manuscripts that the prophets, apostles, and disciples in Antioch originally wrote, ended the Dark Ages and Inquisitions, and there was huge explosion out of the Renaissance that renewed not only religion, but government, science, economics, society, art, music, literature, and health insurances. The book actually made a lot of people become what you call Protestants. People were able to get their own personal real Bible, read it, love it, understand it, left Catholicism, and came to realize that they had been deceived and lied to for over a millennia. But these ex-Catholics were usually captured and burned at stakes as so-called heretics. Satan apparently forged this counterfeit church to counteract true Christian growth. And the Crusades weren't Christian. The Christians caused the Dark Ages? That is a liberal misconception misrepresentation sweeping statement. People would say to me, hey, the Pope accepts evolution. <laughs> but I don't follow the Pope by a long shot because I'm not a heretical Catholic. I follow Jesus. He himself said, in John 3, verse 12, If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe, if I tell you of heavenly things? In other words, if you think the Bible's history in Genesis 1-11 is not true, then how can you trust that the rest of the Bible is true? Secular education would love you to believe that the Bible is not trustworthy, and that science says so. And that's exactly what we have seen. Generations of people have left believing in Jesus as their Savior have listened to much liberal misconception misrepresentations and have decided only to follow worldly wisdom. Paul said, Timothy, you be careful of science this is falsely so called, which some professing have heard, which means left, concerning the faith, but according to this acclaimed accusation, that the Bible teaches the sun goes around the earth, let's take a look at this. In fact, the Greeks were the ones who first developed the idea of geocentrism. The Catholic Church took that idea as fact and tried to superimpose that on the Bible. Through people like Galileo, Copernicus, Kepler, Brahe, and Newton, they were able to figure out that the planets go around the Earth and that the Earth spins. Thanks to God's grace that these men were still able to do good science. A new theory slowly took over. Once it really took hold, incredible advances were made in just a few centuries. This story should teach all scientists a valuable lesson. Don't cling to theories simply because they have been well established in the scientific community. If you can't get the datas to agree with the theory, find a better one. That's what will advance science. But before I finish up, I do want to point out the scripture that Catholicism used as evidence for geocentrism. Joshua 10, verses 12 to 13. Then spoke Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou, moon, in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hastened not to go down for about a whole day. Does this verse say the sun goes around the earth? Certainly not. It indicates that the sun moves relative to Gibeon in the sky. As you know, velocity is relative. If you're on a spinning merry-go-round, everything appears to be moving when you are the one who is moving. In these verses, Joshua commands the sun to stand still relative to a city and to the sky. They do not, in any way, imply that the sun moves relative to the solar system. In the end, these verses are speaking like modern-day physicists would speak. 
they are justly defining reference points. Friend, don't base your reasons upon what you commit to believe at all times. Try investigating and studying it for yourself. Hmm. Very interesting. You Christian apologetics really give some reasonable answers for the world's frequently asked questions. I will see you later, and I hope that we can talk again. I appreciate that, and I'm glad you are satisfied. For more Christian apologetics, go either to drdino.com or in swearsandgenesis.org.